Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Brian Lynn has a report on the discovery of some of the oldest stone tools ever found. John Russell presents this week's everyday grammar report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, this report: the 7.8 magnitude earthquake and aftershocks that struck Turkey and Syria last week killed more than 40,000 people. They also injured at least 100,000 more. Millions now need humanitarian aid after being left homeless and without basic life needs. Busra Civelik is a teacher in Turkey. She looks after 22 children on a passenger boat in the port of Iskenderun. The ship has been turned into a temporary classroom. Shelter and health center. Chivalik said the children have been learning to deal with what happened. Chivalik explained that the children play earthquake with building blocks. They talk about the earthquake. They build blocks and say, "Is this okay for earthquakes? And is it stable?" Chivalik said. They also play with toy fire engines. They say. We have to go to the earthquake area quickly," she added. Hasibe Ebru is a psychiatrist who is working on the passenger boat. She said survivors on the boat are crying a lot, and are having trouble sleeping. I am telling the quake survivors that what they have been experiencing is normal, and these symptoms will gradually decrease in a safe environment," she said. This really calms them down," she added. The long-term mental health effects can only be understood with time, as people deal with trauma in different ways," Abru said. Some of the earthquake survivors were rescued from the rubble, only to learn that family members had died or are missing. Others found the busy neighborhoods they called home had been totally flattened. Late Wednesday, two women were rescued from the rubble in Turkey's southern city of Kahramanmaraş, and in the city of Antakya, a mother and two children were rescued. Elena Olmez is a 17-year-old girl who was rescued from a collapsed building in Kahramanmaraş on Thursday, ten days after the quake. She told reporters from her hospital bed that she was well. She said she tried to pass the time by distracting herself until her rescue. I had nothing with me, she said. Scientists have discovered some of the oldest stone tools ever found at a research site in Kenya, but the find created a mystery about which group of early humans made and used the tools. A study recently published in Science suggests early humans used the tools to cut up animals for food about three million years ago. In the past, scientists thought our direct ancestors were the ones making and using tools, but two teeth from an extinct human-like creature were found at the site. This led researchers to believe that other kinds of hominins might have picked up tools too. The term hominin is still developing and is used to describe species that are considered human or closely linked to humans. 
The team said the newly found tools are probably the oldest example of what is known as the Oldowan toolkit. This was a set of tools that spread across Africa and beyond during the Stone Age. Rick Potts is the director of the Smithsonian's Human Origins Program. He told the Associated Press that he thinks the find adds to existing evidence that our direct ancestors may not have been the only users of Stone Age technology. Those teeth open up an amazing whodunit. A real question of, well, who were these earliest toolmakers? Potts said, the researchers said the tools date back to about 2.9 million years ago, when early humans used them to cut up hippopotamuses and other big animals for food. The study suggests these kinds of tools were widely used earlier than had been believed. Three kinds of tools were found. These included some with flat sides, believed to have been used to crush plants, bone, and meat. Others had sharp edges for cutting meat. Thomas Plummer is with Queens College of the City University of New York, and was the lead writer of the study. He told the AP that with the tools found, early humans could cut and crush a wide range of materials. In addition, he said tools from the Kenyan site also suggested. They had assisted early humans with eating. The site, known as Nyayonga, is in a hilly area on the shores of Lake Victoria. Since starting work there in 2015, researchers have also found many objects and animal bones. Plummer said cut marks on several hippo bones show they were cut up for their meat. The early humans also likely used the tools to break open antelope bones to get out marrow and tissue inside the bones. The study said. Plummer added that the stone tools permitted the early humans to get and process a lot of necessities from the environment. If you can butcher a hippo, you can butcher pretty much anything, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Imagine a person asking you about where you live. How do you respond? How do you give details or more information? In today's everyday grammar, we will explore ways to talk about where you live. You will learn about questions, answers, and different situations where such discussions might be important. Let's start with some useful terms and ideas. Imagine a person asks you the following question: Where do you live? Let's break the question into its individual parts. We have the question word "where," then we have the helping verb "do." Finally, we have the subject and main verb "you live." The kind of answer you give will depend on the situation in which the question is asked. For example, if a friend at school asks that question. They might only want to know the neighborhood or general area where you live. So, for example, a person in New York might give the following answer: "I live in Queens," or "I live in Brooklyn." A person in Cairo might say, "I live in Agusa," or "I live in Shubra." Note that we used. The following structure for all of these statements: subject plus live plus in plus the name of the neighborhood. 
it is possible that the person might ask for more information or details. For example, imagine the following exchange with a friend at school or work. Where do you live? I live in Brooklyn. Really? My brother lives there, too. Where in Brooklyn? There are a few nice ways to respond to this kind of question. Your response can involve the prepositions by or near, as in, I live by Prospect Park. Or, I live near Prospect Park. Or, I live near the intersection of Bedford Avenue and Lincoln Road. These answers involve important locations, a famous park, an intersection. There are, of course, other ways to give details about where you live. So far, we have explored how you might talk about where you live in a friendly, everyday sort of situation. But what should you do if the request is specific? So, for example, official documents or situations often require an exact address instead of a general description. So an official might ask you, what is your name and address? In this case, you could provide your name and the address of where you live. For example, an American person might say, My name is John. My address is 1234 Maple Street, Pleasantville, Alaska, 51099. Note that the general way of giving an address in the United States is as follows. Number, street, city, state, zip code. Let's take some time to work with these ideas. Ask a friend about where they live. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here is the answer. Where do you live? Now imagine a friend asks you about where you live. Use the name of the neighborhood Manhattan in your answer. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here is one possible answer. I live in Manhattan. Now imagine that someone asks the following. Where in Manhattan do you live? Use the noun Penn Station in your answer. Pause the audio to consider your answer. Here are two possible answers. I live near Penn Station. I live by Penn Station. In today's report, we learned about some ways to talk about where you live. You learned about the importance of question words such as where. You also learned about the importance of short words such as in, by, and near, as well as how nouns play an important part in talking about locations. The next time you talk about where you live, we hope that you are able to use some of what you have learned today. I'm John Russell. You just heard John Russell present this week's Everyday Grammar Report. John joins me now to talk a little more about the lesson. Hi, John. Welcome back. Thank you for having me on the show. You mentioned that three words are especially important when you are talking about where you live. In, by, and near. Why is that? These three words often act as prepositions, words that express where nouns are located in space. So, when you talk about where you live, we say that you live in a city, in a small town, in a neighborhood, in a house, or in an apartment. You are using the preposition in to describe where the noun is located. In the examples you gave in the report, by and near have a similar meaning. Are they close in meaning in other situations as well? When you talk about where you live, by and near both mean close to. However, by has many other meanings in different situations, while near has a smaller, narrower meaning. It often just means close to. Well, thanks for answering those questions today, John. Thank you for having me on the show. See you next time. Welcome to The Making of a Nation. 
American History in VOA Special English. In March of 1889, Grover Cleveland left the White House after four years as president. He had been defeated by Benjamin Harrison. As they were leaving, Cleveland's wife, Frances, spoke with a member of the White House staff. She said, I want you to take good care of everything. I want to find it the same when we come back, and we will be back in four years. Frances Cleveland was right. She and her husband moved back into the White House after he became president again in 1893. Grover Cleveland is the only man to serve two terms separated by the administration of a different president. Shirley Griffith and Frank Oliver begin the story of Grover Cleveland's second presidency. Grover Cleveland did not want to be president again, but he was worried about the future of the United States. He did not think President Harrison could solve the serious economic problems the country faced. President Harrison had approved very high taxes on imports. He also had approved an increase in the supply of silver money. Grover Cleveland said both actions had hurt the economy. He also feared that Harrison was not strong enough to oppose the demands of special interest groups in the Republican Party. Cleveland believed he was the only Democrat who could defeat Harrison. He won his party's nomination, and he was easily elected to a second presidency. Grover Cleveland immediately turned to the nation's economic problems. The country seemed headed for a serious depression. Only a few days before Cleveland's second inauguration in 1893, a major railroad failed. Then another big company declared failure. This set off a selling panic on the stock market. In the next few months, almost 8,000 businesses failed in the United States. 400 banks closed. One million workers lost their jobs. The prices of farm products fell lower than ever before, and thousands of farmers, unable to pay their debts, had to give up their farms. Experts offered a number of different reasons for the Depression. Some said it was a plot by members of the stock market to ruin farmers and seize their land. Some said it happened because American factories were producing more goods than people could use. Still others said the problem was caused by the government's money policy. For many years, the United States and other nations used both gold and silver as money. Paper money was used to represent a nation's gold and silver holdings. The value of silver was tied to the value of gold. In the United States in the early 1800s, 15 ounces of silver had the same value as one ounce of gold. This value did not change until after 1860. That was when mines in the western United States began to produce large amounts of silver. The extra silver caused the price of the metal to fall. In 1871, Germany declared that it would no longer support its paper money with silver. Instead, it would use only gold. Other European countries quickly did the same thing. The United States did too. In 1873, Congress passed a law that stopped the government from using silver as money. 
Western silver producers protested. They put great pressure on lawmakers to change the law. Five years later, Congress passed a compromise bill. The compromise bill said the government could issue limited amounts of silver money. It said the government must buy two million dollars worth of silver each month for that purpose. Twelve years later, during President Benjamin Harrison's administration, Congress passed a new silver purchase bill. It said the government must buy four and one half million ounces of silver each month. The Treasury Department would buy the silver with new paper money that could be exchanged for silver or gold. The new law increased the amount of silver money used in the United States. The country soon became sharply divided on the issue of silver money. Wealthy businessmen and bankers did not want to use silver money at all. They wanted the country's economy to be based only on gold. This was what was known as the gold standard. They believed the gold standard would keep the value of the dollar high. Using silver, they said, made the dollar less valuable. Farmers, laborers, and others wanted to use silver money, and they wanted an unlimited supply of it. Without silver, they said, the country's money supply would be too small. Gold would increase in value. People who had borrowed money would be hurt. They would have to pay back loans with dollars that were more valuable than those they had borrowed. President Cleveland supported the gold standard. He opposed any use of silver for money. He said the United States should use only gold, as other nations did. President Cleveland was sure the Silver Purchase Law of 1890 had caused the economic depression. He explained the situation in this way. The law had caused businessmen and investors to lose faith in the government's money policy. They were afraid their money would drop in value as more silver money was put into use. Investors began to withdraw their money from businesses. Banks began demanding early payment of loans. Everyone wanted gold. They took their paper money and their silver to the government, and exchanged them for gold. In 1890, when the Silver Purchase Act was passed, the government held almost 290 million dollars in gold. After two years, withdrawals had cut that amount to 100 million dollars. President Cleveland and other administration officials began to worry. It was possible that gold holdings might fall so low, the government could not support the dollar. Cleveland decided the only answer was to get Congress to kill the silver purchase law. Then the government could stop buying silver; it could return to the gold standard. The Congress was not in session, however; it would not meet again for several months. President Cleveland did not want to wait; he believed the problem was too serious, so he called a special session of Congress. The president did not expect an easy time with the Congress. Many congressmen supported silver money. Especially those congressmen from silver-producing states in the West. President Cleveland believed he could get Congress to kill the silver purchase law, but if he showed any weakness, the fight would be lost. Then, just before the congressional debate, 
he learned he would need an operation. He felt a rough spot in the top of his mouth. It got bigger and more painful. Doctors examined the spot. It was a cancer. President Cleveland asked how long he could wait to have the cancer removed. If it were in my mouth, one of the doctors said, I would have it removed immediately. Cleveland agreed, but he said the operation would have to be kept secret. News from the White House often affected short-term activity on the stock market. News that the president's life was in danger could cause the nation's economic crisis to become worse. Cleveland decided to have the operation on a friend's boat in New York Harbor. Newsmen were told he was going sailing with his friend. Doctors made final preparations. They were not afraid of the operation, but they were afraid of what would happen if news of the operation were leaked to the press. One of them spoke with the boat's captain. If you hit an underwater rock, he said, hit it good and hard, so we will all go to the bottom. As the boat moved slowly up the East River in New York, the doctors put President Cleveland to sleep with an anesthetic drug. Then they began the operation. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation.